Alberta's next Premier Jason Kenney riding to victory in a pivotal election. In the end, it wasn't even close. CBC News projects a strong majority win for Jason Kenney's United Conservative Party. We are in Calgary tonight. Also tonight, maybe we, we, we got some help this time from, 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 uh, from God. Hope as France vows to rebuild Notre Dame Cathedral. But with centuries of history gone, we go in depth on the challenge ahead. This is the next. Alberta has voted and their vote was for change. The province that broke with tradition just four years ago to go NDP has now swung back to conservative rule. For Jason Kenney's supporters, this is a big win after a hard-fought and oftentimes ugly campaign. But that victory for the new United Conservative Party means, of course, a loss for the Rachel Notley and her NDP. She gave her concession speech in Edmonton after four years of leading the province. And you can bet what happened here tonight being watched closely across Canada because on issues like climate change and the economy, tonight's results will have national implications. Of course, Jason Kenney, no stranger to the national stage, though, a former federal cabinet minister, now premier designate in Alberta. Let's head now to Carolyn Dunn, who is at United Conservative Party headquarters. Carolyn, Jason Kenney just gave his victory speech, and it was a long one, I must say. Yeah, it sure was. I guess that's what happens when you have a decisive majority. You get time to talk, don't you? He was in a fighting mood, really, Rosemary, basically saying that he and his team are prepared to stand up to anybody who might be in opposition to Alberta's oil and gas industry. He also gave a very open invitation to business, come to Alberta. He says, we will have lower corporate taxes, we will have less regulation, and uh, a direct appeal for them to uh, start investing in Alberta. And then there was this promise to those that have been hurt by a very lengthy downturn. This democratic decision is a message to all of those Albertans who are struggling, to the unemployed, to those who have given up, to the small business owners barely hanging on, to the young people who got their degrees and their diplomas but can't find work, to those who have lost their homes and their hope after years of economic decline and stagnation. To them, to them we send this message. Help is on the way and hope is on the horizon. And that is a promise that uh, Jason Kenney will undoubtedly be kept to, Rosemary. Okay, so that gives us a sense, I guess, of what uh, he's going to do for Alberta. Give us a sense, though, of what the win means more broadly for, for the rest of the country. Even. Well, you know, uh, there's a lot of disdain for the carbon tax in this province. And so Jason Kenney is promising not only Albertans that the, his first act as premier uh, will be to repeal the provincial carbon tax, but that he is going to join a legal battle against the federal carbon tax. He is also promising to stand up to BC and uh, enact, uh, turn off the TAP legislation if they don't cut their uh, opposition to pipelines to take uh, Alberta oil in to Tidewater, and also that he is prepared to fight Ottawa at every turn on from everything from pipelines to equalization. A, a real, uh, a real tough talking Jason Kenney tonight, and uh, he and his team say they're ready to go, uh, ready to uh, start battling those who have been undervaluing Alberta, as he says. Really interesting to hear him appeal to Quebec in French, too, to try and get another pipeline through a province that didn't want one. Carolyn Dunn at uh, Jason Kenney headquarters tonight. Thank you for all your help, Carolyn. Just before Kenny gave his speech, Rachel, Rachel Notley gave hers. It was, of course, a very different one than the one she wanted to give tonight. I spoke with Rafi Bujakanyan as she was thanking her supporters in Edmonton. 
Though there might have been disappointment in her words, and there's disappointment in this room, there's clearly not a lot of acrimony to words. Rachel Lawley for failing to deliver them a second NDP government. She's essentially saying, look, we're proud of our record. We did a lot. Here is a little bit of what she had to say so far. Four years ago, Albertans hired us to do a very big job at a very difficult time. And we did that job with purpose. And we did it with integrity. And today, Alberta is a better place because of it. Now she went on to list some of what she considers the NDP government's accomplishments during these last four years, including the carbon tax, which she didn't quite name. She just said we acted on climate change. She also talked about raising the minimum wage. Interestingly, both the minimum wage and the carbon tax have been targeted by Jason Kenney's United Conservative Party throughout this campaign. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to her tonight are wondering why she may not have campaigned further on her record during these 28 days. That's a bit of feedback I got from supporters earlier tonight saying that, you know, we've been hearing door to door that we would have liked to see more of the NDP talking about what they've done versus constantly going after Jason Kenney over the controversies that dogged his campaign, but were clearly not enough to stop Albertans from looking at that option. Now, as we've heard all through this campaign, though, the biggest issue that has been, without a doubt, the economy. And for years, Albertans have watched and really worried as the great engine that drives it struggles to keep running. Our Peter Armstrong takes a closer look at the challenge for the next UCP government. The fact is, Alberta's economy isn't just tied to the oil and gas sector. Alberta's economy is the oil and gas sector. When the oil industry booms, Alberta booms, and the rest of the country benefits as well. But since 2008, the price of oil has been erratic at best. That's the global price of oil, but Alberta's oil is harder to get out of the ground and harder to refine, so it trades at a discount. As global prices started showing signs of life, just as things were starting to look hopeful again, that differential on Alberta's heavy oil plummeted. With no new pipelines coming online anytime soon, the province ordered a cut in production and started shipping more oil by rail. It worked to an extent. Investment in the industry is still way down. And so that just speaks to the uncertainty in the sector. Because although prices are good today, people aren't sure they're going to be good in a quarter or two. The lack of investment is how the pain of one sector became the pain of an entire province. Alberta's lost more than 120,000 jobs since 2008. The office vacancy rate in downtown Calgary reached a stunning 24.7%. One quarter of all of these office towers are empty. And the once roaring Alberta economy that led Canada is expected to clock in slightly above Nova Scotia and New Brunswick this year. For all the doom and gloom, the pieces of a recovery are coming together. Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline replacement will add another 370,000 barrels a day of shipping capacity. Until one of those bigger pipeline projects gets approved, the best hope may be shipping oil by railcar. Over the course of the next year and a half, we could be moving as much as 600,000 barrels a day of crude by rail. That's bigger than the TMX. It's maybe 30% less than the Keystone XL. So Alberta's next government inherits this mess. Getting the job market back on track and filling those office towers will require investment. And that requires stability in a market that's been anything but for the better part of a decade now. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. So a big night here in Alberta tonight, Andrew. Everyone's going to be talking about this for many days. But for now, let's turn to developments out of Paris. Yeah, Rosie. And of course, the difficult question of how much was lost in yesterday's terrible fire at Notre Dame Cathedral. Why are you crying? <laughs> it's like a work of art. And I, when I hear people say, oh, we'll just rebuild it. It's not, you just don't rebuild 865 years of history. This video emerged today of tourists on a dinner cruise along the Seine. Best seats in the house for just about the worst thing imaginable. Notre Dame is now the scorched heart of Paris. 
Tonight, we're going to show you just what it would take to restore a monument that is eight centuries old. But first, a city takes stock of the damage. For 15 hours, the cathedral burned, so the site is still a danger zone as inspectors get a closer look to make sure it'll hold. Thomas Daggle takes us there. It's a long way up to make sure nothing else comes crashing down. Crews spent the day checking the structural integrity of this centuries-old Catholic cathedral. And from up there, if you're not afraid of heights, it's plain to see the roof looks decimated. And no wonder. The ferocious fire caught on this video by Bernie and Debbie Drum from Toronto. That's just the smoke they came for Holy Week and witnessed something dreadful. Because this could take decades possibly to repair, but if they do, we will be back. The world is now getting a good look at the intense battle firefighters waged inside Notre Dame Cathedral and that mess left behind. The cross still standing, like a message to believers. There is something inside and something above this cathedral that makes uh, things different. Maybe it, we, we, we got some help this time from, 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 uh, from God. The front of the cathedral may appear unharmed, but look closer and see the symbols of faith scorched. From the back of the cathedral here, it's easy to see the scaffolding that was being used in restoration work. Investigators are looking into the theory that one of the workers involved in renovations may have started the fire by accident. But authorities are warning the investigation will be long and complex. By gutting Notre Dame, the fire indeed gutted the city, with Parisians today making a kind of pilgrimage to see their lady. The firemen were heroes, really heroes, so we, we applaud them. It was very important for me to come this morning because I just wanted to see if it was real. With all Paris has to offer, the cathedral remains a favorite. Some snapped up souvenirs of what it looked like till now. Notre Dame, c'est la, c'est voilà, c'est c'est le cœur de la cité. C'est, Notre c'est Dame is the heart of the city, she says. It's our culture, whether Christian or not. President Emmanuel Macron addressed the nation, announcing he wants Notre Dame rebuilt within five years. Some might call that wishful thinking. For others, it's faith. Now, Thomas, you mentioned a few moments ago the investigation is going to be complex. Why is that? Well, a new timeline tonight is raising questions about whether uh, the damage here could have been prevented in the first place. Consider that the first fire alarm went off at 6.20 p.m. yesterday. There was no smoke or fire spotted. It was believed to be a false alarm. So it was only 23 minutes later when a second alarm went off that uh, the flames were spotted. Uh, People here on the left bank could see smoke billowing from the roof and already that roof was being torn apart by flames. So the question tonight, Andrew, is whether 23 minutes could have made all the difference. Thomas Dagle in Paris tonight. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Now, the questions aside, there's the cold, hard fact that the damage could have been even worse. As that fire was burning, there were fears the entire structure could have collapsed. But try telling that to anyone with even a vague memory of what used to be inside. Properly maintained and cared for, great buildings can be immortal. The people who first worshipped here may be gone. But Notre Dame's grandeur and mystery had only grown with history. And now, after the fire, what's left is blackened, 800 years ripped open to the sky. So how can this Notre Dame ever come back from disaster? As Cam McIntosh explains, they don't build them like that anymore, and even getting close to the original will be tough. Just look at the ash and rubble. Where do you even begin? Rebuilding is a daunting prospect, but not insurmountable, says the foundation that was helping fund renovations here. This morning I said, so now what, what do we need to do? And then uh, let's, let's tackle it. It will be saved. Yeah, yeah, it will be saved. The iconic bell towers and flying buttresses still stand. Inside, the vaulted ceiling along the nave has holes. The exterior roof is gone. Replacing the timber from thousands of oaks that took centuries to grow tall enough may be impossible, as could be replacing some of the treasures inside. It just needs, um, let's say, a lot of attention. Andrew Tallon was a Notre Dame expert who died last year. He may have left behind a starting point. 
pioneering laser imaging work that recreates all the cathedral's dimensions and surfaces, accurate to within millimeters. But right now it's the charred, first up-close looks getting attention. Firefighters inspected those famed 12th and 13th century rose windows, still intact. But this Canadian stained glass expert says a proper assessment will take time. Right now they're waiting for uh, everything to uh, cool down and then uh, they're going to review the masonry and if the masonry is stable enough they'll be, they'll be able to go up and actually look at the glass. 50 years ago a similar fire destroyed Western Canada's largest cathedral. As a teen, historian Philip Mayotte watched it burn. It couldn't be restored. The lesson for Paris is basically you, you know, you've had this tragedy but you've been left with something. What Paris also has is the public, political and growing financial will to go ahead. The president of the EU calling on member countries to help. But at stake here is something more than just material help. For a project certain to face staggering costs, critical elements are already pulling into place. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, Notre Dame is owned by the French state. The costs of insuring it just not an option. It was and is priceless. And it's hard to estimate the cost of rebuilding it. The good news, three of France's richest families, along with a growing list of companies, have together offered the equivalent of about a billion dollars to rebuild Notre Dame. The bad news, the cathedral took more than five million dollars a year just to maintain, and it needed about 200 million dollars worth of structural work before the fire. So the price tag now, sure to be very high. And stick around on this because we are going to bring in someone who spent years studying that very cathedral. And she's going to explain just how complex an operation rebuilding will be. Plus, the growing danger facing Canada's own places of worship. All that's in about 15 minutes. Okay, here are some of the other stories we were watching tonight. Three Ontario teens are facing murder charges in the death of a 17-year-old. Police were called to the scene of an apparent car crash last night near Hamilton, southwest of Toronto. Investigators say the victim was found inside the vehicle but died of a gunshot wound. Two 16-year-olds and a 15-year-old are in custody. Beauceville, Quebec, a town of about 90 kilometers south of Quebec City, is grappling with a huge flood. An ice jam under a local bridge gave way, causing a pretty sharp spike in water levels and spilling over the banks of the Chaudière River. About 230 homes have been affected. Now, the town is used to flooding in its downtown core. It happens just about every year, but residents say not usually this bad, at least not in the last 30 years. CBC News has learned there will be an election in Newfoundland and Labrador on May 15th. Sources tell us Premier Dwight Ball will be with Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote tomorrow morning. Newfoundland was scheduled to have an election in the fall, but the Premier says he doesn't want to interfere with the federal election. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, in PEI, the campaign is in full swing. Leaders squared off in a debate just a week before that province goes to the polls. Topics included housing affordability and economic growth. The vote takes place next Tuesday, but already nearly 14,000 Islanders have voted in advance polls. And next on The National, what investigators now say about a retired city worker accused of a deadly shooting spree in British Columbia. And as nursing home workers in New Brunswick fight for their right to strike, families say their loved ones are caught in the middle. Plus. I was actually watching the news and then a uh, big exploding bang. His incredibly close call ahead in tonight's moment. Welcome back to the Nationals Alberta election coverage. We are in Calgary tonight where the mood among conservatives in this province is one of celebration and no wonder. CBC News projects a strong majority for Jason Kenney's United Conservatives. Albertans have elected a government that will be obsessed with getting this province back to work. A team a team that will do everything in our power every single day to create tens of thousands of good jobs by restoring investor confidence, by unleashing the job-creating power of our entrepreneurs, by, 
by taking, by taking Alberta from being the slowest moving and most overregulated economy in Canada to being one of the freest and fastest moving economies in the world. We are also hearing from the Prime Minister tonight. In a statement, he congratulated Jason Kenney, saying he looks forward to working with the provincial government to address issues of importance to Albertans and all Canadians. He also thanked Rachel Notley for her years of service as Premier. Yeah, now to Penticton, B.C., and the shooting spree that left four people dead yesterday. A retired city employee has been arrested and charged, and Penticton... It's a small place. Lots of people in that tight-knit community either knew the victims or the accused. But even still, so many people are at such a loss to explain how it could have happened. Greg Rasmussen is there. In handcuffs, 68-year-old accused John Britton said nothing as he walked into court. He's now charged with three counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. I recognize that these heartbreaking events have deeply impacted our community. The first victim was shot near Penticton's downtown. Police say the accused then drove five kilometers to a suburban area where three more people were killed in these neighboring houses. I can also confirm that there were two male victims and two female victims in their 60s and 70s. The accused turned himself into police shortly after the second round of shootings. Investigators are still piecing together the relationships between those involved. Our preliminary investigation has determined that the accused and each of the victims were known to each other. The question of motive remains under investigation. The accused worked as an engineer before he retired several years ago. The mayor of Penticton first met Britain when he worked for the city, later seeing him at social events after he retired. Very gentle person. I would have never in a million years ever think that something like this would have happened. You know, I, I mean, I just don't understand. Very, very sad. Today, those who were nearby during the shootings are still processing what happened. Eritrea Williams heard shots, then came out of the shop where she works to see a body on the ground. So we go stand outside and we were wondering what's going on and they say, oh, someone got shot over there. Police aren't naming the victims, but family members have posted that this man, 71-year-old Rudy Winter, is one of those killed. But as for his connection to the accused, police aren't saying, waiting for the courts to reveal what led this man to allegedly murder four people. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Penticton, B.C. And ahead tonight on The National, as Paris begins to sort through the rubble, we'll ask an expert in medieval architecture why the next Notre Dame could look different from the one we know, plus the efforts to protect Canadian churches from a similar fate. The, the, the way they're constructed, the big, the big open spaces, a lot of void spaces, um, and, and you know, in many cases they're not occupied for a substantial uh, part of the time, so there's nobody there to, to discover a fire. bells of Westminster Abbey in London tolled today at exactly the moment the fire at Notre Dame began. And that same act of solidarity was heard in churches around the world, from Cologne, Germany, to New York. No one was killed or even hurt in that fire, but there is a reason the burning of Notre Dame has had such an impact. It is a place shared in the memories of millions across countries, across centuries even, and all of it was being erased by fire before people's very eyes in real time. Consider what that looked and sounded like. It's really, really sad to just watch it all get burned down and ruined by a fire. Bah, envie de pleurer. Ouais. Ça me crée un, un ça me bouleverse. J'aurais eu l'impression d'assister à 
au décès d'un ami et ça me, ça, me rendait, ça me rendait hyper triste. I feel like uh, Paris is all Paris is crying now, ju not just me. The basilic was talking to me, so I wanted to be here to communicate with the place. exist as a symbol and uh, we need it. Le temps, mesdames, messieurs, est à la reconstruction. Le temps, mesdames, messieurs, est à la solidarité, la solidarité dans l'émotion. So you can see and hear the hearts and thoughts of Paris have already started that gradual turn to what's next. How to rebuild a structure that's more than 800 years old. And if it can be done, how different might it end up being? Caroline Rosalius is an art historian at Duke University in North Carolina, also an expert in medieval and Gothic architecture. Caroline, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. You, you spent years studying this very cathedral. Can you tell us what are your greatest concerns when it comes to understanding just how damaged this cathedral may be? Yes, Andrew. Well, looking at the photographs, uh, you can see that the damage to the vault seems to be primarily in two locations, and one at the crossing is where the spire fell through, and another vault has, has failed also. The question right now, and it's urgent and critical, will be what condition are the other vaults in? How much were they damaged by the fire? Because that fire was incredible. It was incredibly hot. And any part of the stone structure, and that's the walls of the building, and that's the vaults of the building, that was adjacent to that fire will be at risk. So it is complicated. On the one hand, you have the stone walls, and that's what you see when you walk in. But then above that, and what you do not see, is what was burning yesterday, a huge wooden roof that's like a forest inside the building. Uh, many, many old oak beams uh, constructed in a very complicated system, uh, that, and, and, and somehow that caught fire. We don't really know quite yet how. But then I also think of the, the challenge of recreating it to the eye, to, to, to a point where it's, it's faithful yeah. to the original and, and accurate. I mean, how difficult would that be? You've got to make a philosophical, maybe even political decision. What state of the building are you recreating? Remember that Notre Dame has been reworked on many occasions in the mid-19th century. Several decades were spent restoring the building after the damage of the French Revolution. That restoration was, in many ways, a reinterpretation of this building. You want to go back to the 19th century reinterpretation? That's fine, and that is where that beautiful spire came from. Or do you want to go back to the 12th century or the 13th century? So complicated discussions need to take place about which Notre Dame, which phase of the history of Notre Dame are we talking about? But, but even just from a practical standpoint, I mean, if you look at the roof, I mean, as flammable as it was, I mean, is, is there a consideration here where you would think, okay, maybe we don't want a strictly accurate representation of how it used to be, but, but, but is there a way to bring this cathedral into the, the 21st century so you don't have the same sort well, of a fire danger as there was? Mm -hmm. That's another critical question, and that, again, will impinge on the amount of time that they need to do the restoration. Do you want to replace the oak beams and have the roof more or less as it was with the original type of material, or do you want to take advantage of new materials that are now available? That part of the roof, of course, is not visible to the public. So, you know, it may be more practical, it may be less expensive, it may be safer to use modern materials, but they will have to decide if that's what they want. One last thing I'd like to ask you is about the timeline. I mean, we heard the French president, Emmanuel Macron, talk about five years as the goal to rebuild the cathedral. I is that possible? 
five years would be wonderful. <laughs> I tend to think that's a bit optimistic. If it's 10 years or 15 years, it will be rebuilt. We can be optimistic and we can think that this building will return to be a vital part of the city of Paris and of the French identity as it was before. Well, Caroline Brazelius of Duke University, thank you for giving us your time and your insights. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye. Now, some of Canada's oldest buildings are also places of worship. Montreal alone has 450 churches that date back to the 1800s or earlier. And that history is far less cared for, far more vulnerable than you might think. Alison Northcott takes us to another Notre Dame, one a lot closer to home. At Montreal's Notre Dame Basilica, a special mass in solidarity with Paris. More than 40 years ago, the basilica was the scene of its own fire when the building's chapel went up in flames. Since then, the church has been brought up to code with fire prevention measures. But not every place of worship is as protected. You can see there's some of the stonework has collapsed here. This church was vacant when a fire broke out last month. If you look up high, it's very similar to the way Notre Dame was built. Gordon Routley with the Montreal Fire Department says structures like this are especially hard to protect. So the, the, the way they're constructed, the big, the big open spaces, a lot of void spaces, um, and, and you know, in many cases they're not occupied for a substantial uh, part of the time, so there's nobody there to, to discover a fire. The Catholic Archdiocese of Montreal says its parishes have been working on fire prevention with sprinklers and alarms, but it says a bigger threat is neglect and the aging, sometimes empty buildings are more at risk of falling apart than burning down. Every neighborhood there should be, you know, uh, a collective uh, reflection on what are we doing with the buildings that are sacred spaces in our neighborhood. This conservation architect says a lot of those spaces lack the money they need to survive. They're vulnerable to a deterioration because there's not the congregation no longer necessarily has the capital funds to invest in the building. They are built well and they can withstand a lot, but they can't withstand decades of, of neglect. The Quebec government says it plans to invest $100 million over the next five years to help protect designated religious heritage sites. But the diocese says that still leaves many other parishes without the money they need. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And up next on The National, we will take you to New Brunswick, where thousands of families are facing uncertainty. I'm worried that if the nursing home workers are indeed allowed to go on strike, that my mother could develop complications and that she could actually die. You're that worried? Definitely. First though, a look at a story you'll see here tomorrow night. Chris Brown takes us to Kiev for a closer look at what's at stake in the upcoming Ukrainian election. Sergei Mokreniak believes getting Crimea back should be the most important issue for Ukrainians as they prepare to elect a new leader. Now in exile, there is no doubt how Russian authorities view him. This is his wanted poster. Your neighbor Sergei is a traitor of Crimea, it says. And there were hundreds of these put up around his hometown. In the spring of 2014, he helped organize anti-Russian protests. I understand that the Russians will continue to prosecute everyone. I was the one who organized the action, but I was forced to go. The talks failed, the protests didn't work, and now after two and a half years, a labor battle in New Brunswick is coming to a head. A judge will hear a case tomorrow over whether nursing home workers should be allowed to strike. It would affect thousands of people, and not just those who live in the homes, but their families too, who, as David Common explains, would be forced to make some very tough choices. Hi, Mom, how are you? You're looking beautiful. If there is a serenity in dementia, it's that Marion Lyons has no idea of the engulfing storm, and her son, Stuart, is consumed 
by what might happen. So happy to see you. As she grips the doll that brings comfort to her confusion, the caregivers in her home and across the province are on the verge of walking out. What that means is uh, basically is that we are the ones that are actually going to be having to take care of her, her care. Across New Brunswick, 4,500 families are being asked what they can do to help. Questions sent home, like letters from a teacher. Could you take your mother home? The answer is no. My mother is uh, bedridden or wheelchair bound and we require a lift in order to get her out of a bed. Can you assign family and friends to stay with your mother to ensure their safety for the duration of a strike 24 hours a day? I don't have enough family and friends to do that, so the answer was no. Neither can he afford to pay someone else to come in. I'm worried that if the nursing home workers are indeed allowed to go on strike, that my mother could develop complications from not getting the, the, the uh, care that she needs and that she could actually die. You're that worried? Definitely. In many ways, this rally in Fredericton is only the latest and loudest version of a fight happening across Canada. Worker shortages in the country's nursing homes. No justice! No peace! And here, a labour war tied directly to the province's ageing population. Older already than the rest of the country, but the same demographic shift is about to sweep the nation. It's, it's not fair. You pay taxes all your life to end up in a home, you raise a family, and you end up being having to ring a bell for 20 minutes because there's only two of us for 30 people. How many people do you look after? So, in a run of a day on my shift, there are two girls, basically, on a floor with 29 residents. We are tired because we are not adequately, adequately staffed. The care home workers argue they're run off their feet, dumping their worn out shoes outside the minister's office to prove a point. They say there are too few staff working for too little money. Exacerbated by hundreds who are leaving the profession, unable to make ends meet. After 28 months of fruitless negotiations, care workers confronted Premier Blaine Higgs. And what happened next stunned many in the province. I have a sister that works for LPN in Alberta, and she makes $10 more than I do an hour. Well, in Alberta, you tell me. that may be true. Yeah. And if, well, if you want true. that kind of wage, then Alberta's where to get it. Well, oh. you, know you made a comment about moving to Alberta. Do you regret it? No, it's a factual. I mean, it, it's it's the reality of, of we we are trying to compete with Alberta's wages, and, and we never have been. And it's a very poor comparison to make. We have never been in a position to compete with, with Alberta's wages. And, and we, I can't go out and tax people more. I so you're saying you can't afford it? Uh, uh, we can't afford it because I don't have the revenue. I can't tax people more to get it. With no one now negotiating, the care workers are asking New Brunswick's highest court to confirm they have the right to strike. If they do and they use it, there may suddenly be just a handful of managers to care for dozens of the fragile and sick in each home. And systemic short staffing is, according to the union, a key issue and problem. We are brothers and sisters of all sectors of unions. Sharon Tier is one of the caregivers who may soon be on strike. Do you have enough people to get residents to the washroom in no. time? No, no, Do you have enough people to feed those who need help? No, no. Can you respond quickly if a resident falls? No. And as the union president, it'll be up to her to decide if they do walk. There's not a nursing home worker, as I said, who want, who want to go out on strike, who look after the most vulnerable. But we can't continue the way we're continuing either. I mean, the crisis is only going to build. We're doing the best with what it is that we have, and that's why our hearts are broken. <laughs> Similar concerns are echoing across Canada. Staffing levels have, in many cases, decreased, even as the acuity of elderly residents has increased. More dementia, more unpredictability, the very vulnerable getting sicker, yet living longer. 
A recent CBC Marketplace hidden camera investigation in Ontario found staff rushing from person to person, often delayed, leaving residents for hours in incontinence products. She's been waiting to use the washroom for like an hour. Stories like that resonate with Sharon Tear. One lady had fallen, uh, had quite a bang in her head um, and quite badly bruised, but for about you know, 15 minutes, they, we could calculate that she had laid there before anyone, um, before anyone was able to come and find her. What does that do to you? Huh. Well, <laughs> I, I, it, it breaks your heart. It's nothing for you to wake up at one o'clock in the morning and go, oh my God, I forgot to mark something and you're calling into the nursing home. I feel that this is a very life-threatening situation. I feel that basically that it's uh, unethical and it's immoral for members of a union um, to walk out on bedridden and uh, wheelchair-bound uh, seniors. Stuart Lyons can't believe there isn't yet an agreement to avoid a strike and keep his mother Marion safe in her nursing home. Our society, we should now be giving back to help her and to make sure that in her last days that, uh, you know, my mother dies with dignity. I don't want my mother to die because a government says we don't have enough money to pay the nursing home workers. That's not the death that I want for my mother. I just want my mother to die naturally, with dignity. After a long life now blurred by dementia, the vulnerable, like Marion, are caught in a fight they don't understand, but one that directly impacts them, with no clear sign of what will happen next. David Common, CBC News, Moncton. And up next on The National, the moment a car slammed through a living room window in Ottawa. Todd yeah. called me and said, you need to get home right away. And I thought it was maybe because it was his birthday, but it was because he'd almost been killed by a car. That close call is our moment tonight. But first. In case you missed it, more than five years after hockey players and figure skaters last teamed up to compete for glory, Battle of the Blades is coming back. And nobody was happier or more surprised than the co-creator of the show herself, retired figure skating great Sandra Bezik. I didn't realize um, how much momentum there was still behind the show from the general public. Children loved it. Their grandparents loved it. It, was, it is one show where the entire family can sit together and have some fun. Now, it's fair to say the world has changed since 2013, and Bezik says the new Blades will reflect that. We're working on different ideas to involve the audience. We really want Battle of the Blades to be open to everyone. We, we, we hope that it's, it's diverse and uh, full of life from, from every direction. Not everything has been ironed out yet, obviously, but in this modern era with unpredictable tastes, there's always room to, uh, how shall I say, experiment? A perfect headline. Not that we're, uh, you know, making suggestions or anything. Season five of Battle of the Blades will air this fall on CBC television. Well, it would otherwise have been a regular Tuesday morning in Ottawa for Todd Edwardson. He was watching TV in his living room, but then an SUV crashed right through his front window, just narrowly missing him. He's okay, though, uh, still wrapping his head around what happened. Have a listen to how he tells it in tonight's moment. I was actually watching the news, and then a uh, big exploding bang. I, I just looked around to the door and then went, went to the door and taking it didn't really do a lot and I, first I called my uh, wife shortly after. Todd yeah. called me and said you need to get home right away and I thought it was maybe because it was his birthday but it was because he'd almost been killed by a car. I would say the, the couch is a couple meters away from the window. I was sitting on that couch. There was a desk at the window and that's of course crushed. All the, all the glass around me and you know could have been a very different situation. I'm pretty shaken. You're not uh, expecting a car to come through your window. 
Yeah, I'll say. So, so at this point, you may be wondering, so what the heck actually happened? Uh, we don't really have many details about the person who was driving the car itself, except to know that she was taken to hospital. She's in stable condition, but as for the house, you can see really badly damaged, and that couple won't be going back anytime soon. That's The National for this April 16th. Have a good night.